A few days ago, friend of the channel Justin Yi released this video, taking a real 2003 Sonoma setup and trying it out on iRacing. Much like Justin, when I saw the setup hit the interwebs, I immediately thought, content. However interesting a video concept this may be, there are a few major flaws with this video, so let's talk about it. Quick side note, if y'all would like to try the setup out and follow along, I've linked the build in the description below along with a matching paint scheme. If you would like to skip right to the speed and handling comparison, feel free to jump to the time code on screen. So what exactly is it that Justin got wrong? First of all, Ryan, I gotta flame you a little bit. What is going on with this cross weight, man? Click clack, sneak attack, don't skimp on correct cross weight. On a more serious note, overall, Ryan, you did a great job transferring the setup sheet values into the sim and giving Justin a chance to trial this setup out and rake in uh, how many views? What Justin got wrong is more fundamental. It lies in iRacing limitations not in the sense of tire modeling or lack of g-forces, but the limitations of parameters. You see, when building out this setup, I had 145 reference points to import into iRacing. Of those reference points, only about 38 were available within iRacing. Now, those 38 reference points are by far the most crucial, but you can begin to see the problem. Without the ability to fully spec out on a part by part, inch by inch, mathematical precision basis, the rest of this sheet is almost entirely worthless. But why? You see, this entire video is one giant veil disguise to educate you. Educate you on the difference between static and dynamic measurements, and to help you begin your understanding of setup packages. All of these measurements and values all share this trait. They are taken when the car is completely still, lifeless. Once a car is on track, it experiences loads, or more practically, forces. These forces act upon the car, changing its character. For an example you know well, think when you slam on the brakes. Your front ride height will decrease alongside a proportional increase in rear ride heights. When you slam into one of these mountainous hillsides, the entire car will compress. Coming up over the crest at 3A, the whole car will decompress and it'll increase its ride height. Okay, cool, whatever, cargo squat, cargo jump. But what does this have to do with Justin's video? For that, we have to dive under the skin and talk about suspensions. I'm not sure if you know this, but metal doesn't exactly stretch. Well, not at least in the way our skin might. Here is a basic illustrative connection between the chassis and the tire. Now, if the suspension were to compress and the tire could not rotate and move, here is what would happen the suspension would have to be disconnected. So if instead we move the tire, we notice it is rotated. This phenomenon is called camber gain. The severity of your camber gain is entirely controlled by your suspension geometry, the length and positioning of your connections, those control arms. You can even have negative camber gain, but you actually lose camber as the suspension travels. In my time interning for the then DGR Crosley NASCAR truck team, their static left front camber values would regularly be 9 to 12 degrees. I mean, it looked ridiculous. However, once the car was hooked up to the pull-down rig, we would measure left front camber at about 1 degree. A pull-down rig, for those who don't know, being a machine that can simulate the loads expected on track. While the left front tire would lose camber, the opposite would occur on the right front tire. And this was all controlled by what suspension geometry you selected. So if we look back at Robbie Gordon's 2003 Sonoma setup, we can see that they had the car set to negative 3.5 degrees of left front camber and negative 1.75 degrees of right front camber. However, without knowing their exact suspension geometry, these static values are practically meaningless. That camber split could be present dynamically, or it could disappear entirely. There's no way to know without seeing the dynamic pull-down rig version of this setup sheet. One funny story from my years of competitive iRacing. Back in late 2017, I was competing in the iRacing Pro Series trying to make it into the Coke Series. One week we showed up to Darlington and John Gorlenski absolutely took off in the opening five laps of the race. I mean like three to four tenths a lap faster than I was. Sitting in second, I kind of just accepted my fate. I had nothing for that. However, by lap seven, suddenly I was gaining four, five, six, seven tenths a lap on him. Oh, so confident, I flew up on the back of John, figuring he had accidentally run his qualifying setup in the race. 
and just as I went to pass him, a light switch went off and poof, John was gone. I mean, nearly lapped the field gone. A John was amongst the first to discover the new oval meta, a term the legendary Keegan Leahy would infamously coin in a vague forum post with two words, camper gain. By shoving as much camber as possible, you could break the iRacing tire model. In the first three laps, you would superheat the tire, causing you to lose about seven tenths per lap. However, by lap seven, you would plateau, and the car would refuse to lose any more pace. By the end of 30 laps, a camber gain setup could be over a second a lap faster than a traditional setup. Now, obviously, you could run maximum static camber, but the real sauce came by maxing out your front ride heights and traveling the car at speed, in the process gaining a crazy amount of right front camber. Now, obviously, none of this was realistic, so iRacing put out a patch that changed the suspension geometry, preventing travel from gaining camber. So what did the setup builders do? They found a new suspension exploit by maxing out the left front heights and traveling only that side, in the process gaining more camber than was even possible on the old geometry. Finally, iRacing had enough of this tomfoolery and put a limitation that your static left front height couldn't be higher than your right side height. Once the V7 tire came around, the superheating bug was fixed, and goofy camber gain setups no longer hold the pace advantage they once did. But the memory persists. I brought this story up to showcase just how critical suspension geometry is to a car's dynamic personality. I only brought up camber, but the same logic applies to tow, crossweight, caster, etc. This is why if you whack a stiff right rear spring into an oval setup, your car is suddenly looser. Despite not changing your static crossweight, your dynamic crossweight was lowered due to the stiff right rear spring. Now, this is the concept behind setup packages. Two setups can have the exact same dynamic crossweight and camber values, having largely the same balance mid corner. However, they could get there in entirely different ways, one with a much lower static cross and one with a much higher one, one with much more static camber and one with less. This would affect how the car transitioned from mid corner to the straights. So I hear you ask. Well, if dynamic measurements are all that really matters, why doesn't iRacing provide a virtual pull-down rig for us to utilize? And while it would be helpful, the reason iRacing doesn't provide such a thing is inherent to your statement. Real racing teams are more than happy to provide static values to us consumers. But if they were to reveal how those static values manifested dynamically, well then suddenly they'd be revealing the ingredients to their secret recipe. This is why Justin was wrong to even try. But hey, it made it for a fun video concept and gave me an excuse to teach you something new. Though you might be wondering, if this whole concept was flawed, then why is the real life setup so similar to the iRacing fix setups in both settings and lap time? Well, funny enough, all of the Gen 4 iRacing fix setups are based on a real team's notebook from 2003, just tweaked here and there to match iRacing suspension geometries and to make them a little easier to handle. Oh, also, if you were wondering why the spring rates are so odd, that's due to manufacturing variations. When a team buys a spring, they rate it themselves and catalog its exact spring rate, rather than relying solely on whatever the within manufacturer tolerance value was. Thanks for watching.